This is the record that God has given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. He who believes on him is not condemned, but he who believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height or depth, nor any other created thing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Before we begin our study of God's word this morning, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're thankful that we can come together now to be refreshed, encouraged, strengthened by your word. Our Lord, pray that we might be sanctified in truth, and that truth is your word, according to his prayer. That it is in your word that we know truth with a capital T, and it is not simply something that is true, but it is the absolute foundation of all truth and the bedrock for uh, successful living. Because successful living is living in light of how we were created as those in your image and likeness that we have a mission that you have set forth for the human race. We're not just some accidental result of an electrical discharge and a blob of protoplasm, but that we were designed to reflect you to all of creation and that we were to rule over creation. And because of sin, we have... Uh, fallen, and it is difficult now to fulfill that uh, mission because of sin. But nevertheless, you have sent the one who will enable us to do that eventually, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, who paid the penalty for our sin, that that sin penalty, having been done away with, might be uh, ultimately removed from creation, and we might fulfill all that you have intended for us. Now, Father, as we come together to reflect upon your word, may we be reminded that this is your word, that you have revealed these things to us, that this is the authoritative uh, word that you have given and sustained and uh, preserved down through the centuries. And, Father, we pray that as we study, we might come to a greater, more precise understanding of what you have revealed. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We're continuing our study this morning in a, sort of the fourth installment of a, of a sub-series, you might say, in our study of Colossians. We are in Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, and as a um, sort of as a stepping off point from this verse, I've been going through a short sub-series on understanding the will of God. How do we know the will of God in our life? How do we know what God wants us to do? How do we go through a process of decision-making in coming to understanding God's will? And in doing this, the, I introduced this concept more last time. This is a concept that has been co- come to be known as the wisdom approach to studying God's, uh, God's word and defining or deciding and determining God's will in our life. Uh, The point here is that God guides and directs us only through his word overtly and that covertly he may guide and direct us in other ways, but he is no longer in the process or business of giving special revelation. The issue today is not doing what was done in the Old Testament time or during the early church, and that is seeking God's direct revelatory will for certain circumstances, but to take his word that we have learned and that we have studied and then being able to apply that in the issues of our own lives so that God would be glorified. Colossians 3.15 is a verse that sounds and has been taken by many to be a divine guidance passage. It reads in the English, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. Now, this is an example of how often verses are chopped in half, 
how often verses or phrases are taken out of context and they sound good as a standalone sentence, but that's not what the context indicates is being discussed. As I've pointed out in the introduction of these four uh, for uh, messages is that this is to be understood not as the peace of God in the sense of uh, internal calm or tranquility because somehow now we've hit upon the right decision and God lets us know it's the right decision because he gives us this internal uh, internal peace. The idea here rather is that the peace that we have is an external peace, the peace within the body of Christ. This is how the terminology is used in Colossians. It is related to the uh, teaching of reconciliation in Scripture, that we have been reconciled with God. So there is a vertical reconciliation that has taken place. And because of that vertical reconciliation and peace with God, there is a horizontal uh, peace with God, that is related to others in the body of Christ. If sin is not an issue between us and God, then sin should not be an issue between us and other believers, and we are to take this objective reality of peace, uh, the peace of God, and apply that in our uh, personal relationships. This is not talking about uh, a principle of decision-making in terms of what should I do with my life and is God going to give me peace with this decision, but it is that we are to pursue peace. As uh, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 12, we are to pursue peace with all men. And this is indicated in the second half of the verse where it's talking about our being called into one body. Uh, the focal point, the context of Colossians 3 uh, starting in about verse 12, is on uh, the forgiveness to one another, loving one another, and, ha- and implementing the objective reality of the peace that we have uh, with one another in terms of our uh, personal relationships. But that does raise the question, well, how do we know God's will? And so I have been addressing this uh, as a counterpoint to what is often taught on this subject, that God has a perfect will for every decision in life. And I emphasize that word because this is how this is often taught, that whatever the decision is that you or I have to make in life, God has one and only one will for that. And what I've been pointing out is that that is not what we see in the Scripture, because the Scripture does not tell us in the revelatory passages of Scripture what you should do uh, each and every day, what you should eat, what you should not eat. Uh, There were specifics on that under the Mosaic Law, but not today. Uh, but that gives you the framework for deciding if, if everything is clean, according to Acts chapter 10, and the Mosaic Law has been set aside, then it suddenly becomes your responsibility and my responsibility to decide how we can wisely eat. Just because it's God doesn't say it's wrong doesn't mean it's healthy or wise to eat everything. We're not, we know we shouldn't uh, go live on a diet of uh, chocolate chip cookies. I know some of you would like to, uh, or bluebell ice cream, and you all know that I would not object to that. But that's not going to be a healthy diet. It's not wise. But the Scripture doesn't tell us it's not wise. It gives us general principles uh, that we are to then apply and uh, in, in each of our lives. So that's why this is called the wisdom principle, and I'll make that a little more clear as we go through. So the, the Bible doesn't teach that God has a specific thing in every, each and every situation, every decision, a specific will for us. In fact, this is really a form of mysticism. It's the idea that if for every decision, God somehow is going to reveal to me in some way what decision I should make. And see, that involves special revelation. Special revelation is a theological term that describes God directly intervening in the normal course of life by communicating something to man uh, uh, apart from the canon of Scripture. Uh, The canon of Scripture is one form of special revelation, but the form that I'm talking about here would be something in addition to Scripture. For example, if I were to, to pray that God would Uh, direct me whether I should choose to go to uh, one university or another university or whether to buy this house or that house or whether to work for this company or that company. I'm actually expecting God to 
uh, break into human history and to reveal either through uh, some verbal means or nonverbal means, such as making me feel right about the decision, that's a form of communication, uh, that this is his, his will. That is a form of special revelation. And the scripture is very clear that special revelation has ceased. So the issue now is not on uh, an issue related to um, making a decision in terms of the specifics, but in terms of taking everything that God has given us and then from, the, that, from that foundation applying that in the decisions that we make. Uh, if Hebrews 4.12, rather, is the uh, passage I mentioned earlier, we're to pursue peace with all people. This is part of God's will. It is an overt statement. Except this is like a lot of aspects of God's overt statements of his will that a lot of people are uncomfortable with. Well, I can't pursue peace with so-and-so or with this person or that person. Well, why are you even concerned about the will of God if you, in areas that God doesn't address when you're not willing to submit to the will of God in areas he specifically addresses? So my point here is simply that, that God in his word uh, gives us uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of commandments and prohibitions, and that defines the boundary uh, of his will. As a background, just for those who are new or visiting, uh, as I've defined the ter- the, these terms, will of God, as they are understood usually by, by uh, pastors, theologians, Bible teachers down through the centuries in terms of three broad categories. Uh, the first is called God's sovereign will. God's sovereign will. God is the ruler of his creation, and he oversees uh, the movement of his creation toward an ultimate end. And so God often exercises his sovereignty to uh, move things in certain directions. Sometimes he prevents us from accomplishing things we wish to accomplish. He prevents nations from accomplishing things they wish to accomplish. And sometimes he, uh, as part of his sovereign will, he also uh, permits man to make wrong, evil, sinful, or foolish decisions because he has given us freedom. Sometimes he overrides those bad, evil, sinful decisions. Sometimes he does not. And we usually refer to that as something like a permissive will, which I'll mention again in just a minute. So sovereign will is also known as his decreed will his or his secret will. We don't know what it is until it happens. Second category is what's called God's moral will, sometimes his revealed will, and this refers to what God has specifically told us to do or not to do. It is God's revealed will that we should not murder. It is God's revealed will that we should pray without ceasing. It is God's revealed will that we are to pursue peace with all men. This is part of what God has told us uh, to do, or in some cases, not to do. But there's a, there's a difference between his revealed will. Some people may say this is God's highest form, the highest will, but that's not always the best term to use for it, I don't think. But this is what he desires us to do in obedience uh, to him. Uh, when God has a specific will, which sometimes refers to a certain function or operation or living in a certain place, a geographical will, he's always expressed that in the, through some sort of special revelation. Every example that we have in Scripture is an example of God's special revelation. When he spoke to Jonah, when he uh, spoke to Paul, when he spoke to Peter and directed them to certain places, that was his special Uh, That was part of his specific geographical will. But my point in all of this is to help us understand, I think this is a very freeing concept for us when we come to understand how to make decisions in God's will, is that often God doesn't have a specific will. Sometimes he does. We'll address that in a little more. But frequently he doesn't. An example that we saw this last Tuesday night in our Acts study is in Acts chapter 8, at the beginning of Acts 8, we see the breakout of a persecution in Jerusalem so that the Christians, the believers who are living in Jerusalem, leave Jerusalem in order to find uh, peace and stability somewhere else because there is an an outbreak of hostility and opposition uh, to Christianity. The apostles remain in Jerusalem, we see, but, but they leave. 
The next thing we're told is that Philip, one of the seven who is chosen in Acts chapter 6 to help help the uh, apostles in ministering to the uh, Hellenistic uh, widows in Jerusalem, is up in Samaria. But God did not direct him there. He just went there. He, that's, that's part of this uh, non-directive will of God. He, he knows that he's under a mandate that uh, back in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, to, uh, that once the Holy Spirit came, which was on, on the day of Pentecost, that he is to then take the word and go out from Jerusalem to Samaria and Judea to the uttermost parts of the earth. So Philip, in his, in his thinking, decides, I'm going to head up to um, head up into Samaria and begin to uh, proclaim the gospel and to evangelize the Samaritans. And that's exactly what he did. That's the first part of that chapter. The second part of that chapter, though, we see that God also has a specific or directive will, and the Holy Spirit sends him and transports him miraculously to a location where he is going to have an encounter, which we'll study this coming Tuesday night, with a, the, an, an Ethiopian eunuch who is a court official from Ethiopia, probably a proselyte, as I introduced the concept last week, a proselyte at the gate who is reading through Isaiah 53 and is confused by its meaning and its application to, to the Messiah. And Philip then explains the passage to him, and he comes to understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament uh, messianic prophecy. So here in that one chapter, you have an example of wisdom on the part of Philip. No, there's no directive will of God to go to Samaria, to go to Judea, to go wherever. He just makes a decision based on the doctrine that he has in his own soul. And then later in the chapter, God does have a specific place for him to go, and he goes there. But it's, it's not that he always has, that's the point I'm making, some people get this wrong. They, they think if God doesn't always have a specific geographical will for you, then you're saying that he never has a specific geographical will for you. That's, and that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there are times when God wants us in a specific place doing a specific thing. And the lesson we learned from Jonah is no matter what you do, you can't avoid that. So don't get all wrapped up in a knot trying to figure out what that is. Uh, the promise of Scripture is that if we are trusting in the Lord and commit our way to Him, then He will bring it to pass. Okay? So God's specific will, uh, is there is a specific will at times. Uh, we also talked about God's overriding will. Uh, so this category of this might be also His permissive will. He clearly permitted Jonah to get on the ship to go to uh, to go to Spain to avoid the command of God to go to Assyria. But then God overrode that decision of, of Jonah. So Jonah, God doesn't abrogate our volition, our free will. He allows us to make those decisions. But if we make a bad decision and God's specific will is different from that, just like Jonah, we can't avoid it. We will end up where God wants us to be. So I've charted it this way in the past. We have God's sovereign will and his moral will indicated by these two circles. God's sovereign will often includes things that he has, uh, are not part of his revealed will, things he permits to happen. Uh, the moral will involves that which he has directed, but it's not always his sovereign will. And these only overlap in some, uh, uh, some areas. Uh, so we have these uh, distinctions, and so I'm, I have charted this this way, that that green circle is the boundaries that are defined by all of the mandates, imperatives, and prohibitions in the Scripture. That's what we need to be concerned with, not am I living in the right house, going to the right school, am I um, married to the right person? That's not the focus of, of Scripture, uh, we may ask those questions in other contexts, but not in terms of God's, uh, God's will. So that brought us to the tenth point. All of that sort of summarizes what I've covered in the last three weeks. The tenth point, which I touched on at the end last week, was that knowing God's will is based on this knowledge of doctrine that has been assimilated in the soul. 
that God the Holy Spirit teaches us doctrine, and through that he guides and leads us. It is God the Holy Spirit who works in a covert way rather than an overt way. And let me explain the difference. An overt way is where there would involve some sort of special revelation. A covert way is a way that is secret, a way that is not perceived by us until the events are over with. And then we look back at the events and the course of decision-making that we made, and we recognize that that even though at the time we may not have been consciously aware and probably were never consciously aware of how God the Holy Spirit was orchestrating circumstances and events, we can look back on it and see that he was. And that brings about the, the uh, uh, end results. So when we approach decisions, though, we don't know these factors. All we know is what the Word of God has told us and what we have learned. And in the process of learning, we accumulate what Scripture calls wisdom. Wisdom is not something that is uh, easily learned. Wisdom in Scripture is not, uh, it, it's not sort of like a, a, a overt objective principles that in every ca- in cases of X you always do Y. There are cer- certain elements of that, but generally wisdom applies where there's no direct statement of Scripture. You're not facing a decision that involves a moral issue. You're not facing a decision that involves a specifically spiritual issue, an overtly spiritual issue, although that affects everything at some level. You are facing a decision such that appears from every overt vantage point to be something of a neutral issue. Whether or not you should work for this company or that company, whether or not you should live in this city or that city, whether or not you should go to this university or that university, whether or not you ought to buy this house or that house. And so none of the factors here that are uh, significant or that present themselves to you are necessarily, um, necessarily involve a moral issue. Now, if they do... And you sit there and say, well, if I make this decision, then I may have to compromise my my spiritual standards in this area. Then you know that that is not a positive for making that decision. Uh, You may look at another decision and say, well, if I make that decision, then that's going to enable me to uh, be more involved in uh, some sort of ministry. It's going to put me in a location where I have a, a solid Bible teaching church where I can grow and learn the Word of God and, and mature as a believer. And that's a positive. But the decision itself doesn't make one or the other of those things happen. So it, these are just secondary corollary factors that are taken into account in making a wise decision. The concept of wisdom in Scripture is a concept related to the skillful application of God's Word, and that may be applied a number of different ways. So this ultimately, though, is under the ministry of God the Holy Spirit. Scripture says that we are to walk by means of the Holy Spirit, and He's the one then who uh, guides and directs us. We only can walk by the Spirit if we are walking in accordance with God's Word. Some of the passages that touch on this would be Colossians 4.12. At the conclusion of this epistle, Paul talks about Epaphras, who has been the messenger (coughs) between the um, uh, congregation and Paul, who is in prison in Rome, Epaphras. And he, uh, he says, states about Epaphras that he is one of your number, a servant or slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly, for you in his prayers. And the, the, the word that's used there is the Greek verb agonizo, which has this idea of, of intensely working towards something. It's come over into English as agony, and that gives you something of the nuance, but it involves someone who is doing something uh, intensely and purposefully, and he is doing this, he's laboring intensely, in his prayer. So Paul is just emphasizing that Epaphras is praying consistently uh, for this congregation for the purpose 
that they stand perfect and fully assured. That's the uh, New King James translation. The word perfect is teleos, indicating maturity, and the word fully assured is a, is a word based on plerao. It means to be, it has the idea of being full or complete or sufficient. In other words, what uh, Paphras is praying for is that the members of this congregation would reach spiritual maturity, and they would continue to grow and not uh, fall by the wayside, and that the way this happens is in the all the will of God, that the means of growth is by knowing the will of God. So we know from other passages the means of growth is the Word of God, and so the place that we understand the will of God is in His Word, not through some sort of external um, mystical insight into God's plan uh, or God's uh, uh, God directly revealing something to us. Romans 12, 2 is another passage that uh, indicates an objective sense of the will of God is revealed in Scripture. We're not to be conformed to the world, that is the, the zeitgeist or the spirit of the age, but we are to be transformed by the re- renewing of our thinking for the purpose that our lives demonstrate. That's the sense of that, that you may prove, that is that, Uh, for the purpose that our life may demonstrate what the will of God is, that by walking according to the revealed standards of God's Word, we demonstrate that that is what is good and acceptable and perfect, or that is what brings to maturity or completion. Ephesians 5.17 is another important verse. This precedes a key verse, in Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5.18, talking about be filled by means of the Spirit. That is preceded by this verse, so then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now what's important about this verse is that in the context of Ephesians 5, there's the emphasis on being wise and the use of time, and then it's contrasted with not being foolish. So here's a contrast between foolish and wise. These are not, while they are Uh, absolutely distinct categories, they are generally broader categories than right or wrong. Uh, Wise, uh, some things are are wiser than other things. There's more of a sliding scale there. Some things are more foolish than other things. There's more of a sliding scale there as we come to understand Scripture. So how do we avoid being foolish? We have to understand what the will of the Lord is. And in the context of Ephesians 5, that's walking in the truth. Again, it is following the objective revelation of God. Ephesians 6.6, 6, we're not to uh, work in, uh, for our employers or for uh, our masters by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. That is, obeying Scripture Uh, totally, completely serving Christ, recognizing that whoever you work for, you're not working for them, you're really working for Christ in that position. So all of that is to emphasize the fact that, that the Scriptures show that the will of God is something that you can know. It's not a guessing game. It is something you can know, and you can know it because God has already revealed it to us in His Word. And it is through God the Holy Spirit, though, that we come to really implement that in our life. This eleventh point is that as we learn doctrine, as we learn what the Scripture teaches, the Holy Spirit is the one who stores that in our souls. This is a whole process that Scripture talks about. Walk by means of the Spirit, walking in the truth, walking in the light, that it is God the Holy Spirit who is the one that as we walk by the Spirit, He takes the Word and He helps us to understand it, and he, he stores that in our soul so that at the time we need to apply it, he is the one who works to bring it to our attention so that we can uh, then apply it. And it is that realm of application that is what the Bible talks about in terms of wisdom. It is that skillful application of the word. It's not the Greek concept of wisdom, which is more of an intellectual philosophical idea, The uh, Old Testament idea of wisdom, which is the biblical view, is that of practical, skillful uh, living. The twelfth point is that along with uh, specific teaching for specific situations, and there are clearly those in the Scripture, there's also doctrine which just produces wisdom. It gives you a framework of thinking. Uh, Let me give you an illustration, an example. 
We make a lot of decisions in life. You and I have made many decisions. By the grace of God, we have not felt the consequences of many of our wrong and foolish decisions. And by God's grace, we have on occasion made wise decisions in applying God's word. And it's always struck me as sort of the irony in the whole process of decision making that many of the most determinative decisions, the most significant decisions that we make are made before we're 21 years old when we don't have much wisdom and we have a lot of foolishness. And we make decisions related to career choices. We make decisions related to uh, how we respond to authority. We make decisions related to uh, our involvement in church spirituality. We make decisions related to marriage, children, many, many other things today that have uh, incredible consequences for the rest of our life. In fact, we make some decisions It's possible to make some decisions that are so bad uh, before you're 21 that it really does limit future options. And there, on the other hand, there are uh, opportunities to make extremely wise decisions before you're 21 or 22 that open up tremendous vistas of opportunity later on, uh, later on in life. And so, Uh, We need to develop, uh, as we're growing up, and this is part of what parental training is about, we need to develop a a framework of thinking about life so that out of that framework we make wise decisions rather than foolish decisions. And often what I see in as, as Christians respond to the pressures of the world around us to conform to it in terms of ideals, in terms of careers, in terms of of many other things, that the decisions that we make uh, that are determinative, like such as what, where are we going to go to college? Where, what are we going to study in college? Uh, what kind of a career are we going to pursue? That we get caught up in a lot and answering a lot of questions when we don't pay attention to the ultimate question that we should be concerned about as believers, and that is, how can I best serve God with my life? Now, when your question is, where, where can I go to college so I can get a good education and go make good money, that's going to have a, maybe a different answer than where can I best serve God with my life? Where can I go to university? Where can I go to college? Where can I live? where I can best serve God. And the result may not be seen in the difference in those two, the answers to those two questions for 10, 15 years. But if you pursue the, goal, the, the career goal, the high education goal, and I'm, I'm not knocking high education. This is, ex- I think it's extremely important. But we can make choices to go to X university instead of Y university that put us in a different geographical area, that put us in a different social circle, that put us in uh, uh, under different influences that, that some may be good, some may not be good. It may put us in a place where we don't have any opportunity for uh, Christian fellowship, biblical teaching, to keep our focus on the ultimate priorities. And 10, 15, 20 years down the road, we're saying, where did I mess up? Why isn't my life what I thought it would be when I was 18 or 19 years old? And the reason is that some decisions that were made that did not appear to be uh, morally, spiritually significant were not answered with wisdom, but with a sort of self-absorbed foolishness that is now bearing bad fruit. So we need to be very concerned about this this whole concept, and especially teaching young people, is how do we make wise decisions? And wisdom comes out of a framework, out of building, as it were, if you think about it as, as a gardener, is packing the soul with the right kind of soil so that it produces a certain kind of decision-making and maybe not too many weeds. And, and if you don't have that as part of the mix in the soul, in your soul when you make decisions, then you're, you're not really always going to make the right decisions because there's not enough of God's word in your soul to orient you in the right, in the right decision. So a wisdom decision in the second paragraph is related to the application of doctrine to a decision where the test is not always the final uh, the, the final decision. In other words, are you going to make a right decision or a wrong decision? But the issue is, how do you make the decision? 
the process, taking it before God, making sure that the questions you're at, asking in relation to the decision relate to a biblical scale of values and priorities and not in terms of uh, uh, what I might call the world's standards of personal success and achievement. But we're focusing on God's uh, spiritual success and achievement. So that it is this stored doctrine, this framework, that gives us the discernment to recognize when some decisions uh, may involve a distinct geographic or a distinct operational will from God. That only comes from, from maturity. And if you are practicing in the small decisions the principles of seeking God's will and uh, applying wisdom to those decisions, then later in life when it comes to significant decisions, then you've built a pattern and a framework for doing that. But if you wait till you're 25, 30, 35, 40 years old and all of a sudden decide, you know, I need to start thinking differently about life, it's not that you can't. There's always hope and change, a real change on the basis of God's Word. But the reality is is that that you're starting late. You haven't laid that foundation in your soul of God's Word. And that's the the foundation out of which wise, good, healthy decisions uh, will come. Now, the next few points are pretty quick. Uh, <clears throat> just a reminder, the point 13, the geographical will of God relates to operating in a specific location. For example, Jonah in Nineveh, Paul in Rome. Now, God did not overtly reveal to Nehemiah in Nehemiah 1 that Nehemiah should go to Jerusalem. That was a wisdom decision out of all of the knowledge that Nehemiah had of God's word. When he looked at what was going on in in Jerusalem, that the fortifications were not being completed, that the city was defenseless, and no progress was being made from his framework of the knowledge of Scripture, he knew that was not what God wanted. And so he went to the Lord in prayer as to what could be done. He's not thinking, Lord, do you want me to go to Jerusalem and finish the walls? That that question's never asked. What instead is he prays that God would give him wisdom in bringing this attention to the king, and then when he does that, uh, the king says, "Well, I'm going to send you." So you see how God's working behind the scenes. He's and and moves Nehemiah there. But it's not because Nehemiah said, okay, Lord, I want to decide whether this is what I want to do. I should go there or not. So that's a difference between a directive revelation of God, Jonah, go to Nineveh, Paul, uh, go to Rome, or a non-directive approach. Point number 14 relates to the operational will of God, which includes how you use your spiritual gifts and your natural talents and abilities. We all are born with certain natural talents and abilities. You have an IQ. You have natural affinities for certain things. You have a uh, genetic predispositions towards certain things. Some people have genetic predispositions towards music. Other people have genetic predispositions towards uh, uh, athletics. Others have genetic predispositions towards uh, mathematics. I don't understand those people. Um, But we all have different talents, natural talents. Then we have spiritual gifts. Sometimes I hear people say, well, they, I don't have the spiritual gift of, of singing. That's not a spiritual gift. Unbelievers can sing. I know you didn't know that, but unbelievers can sing. Now, you may have a natural talent of music and the ability to sing, and then that is wedded with a spiritual gift of service. And so you can serve in the congregation by singing in the choir or being an anchor point within the congregation on on singing because you have a good solid voice and the congregation needs uh, key people who know how to sing uh, within the congregation so that as others who can't sing quite as well, they can hear the stronger voices within the congregation and anchor on them. That's part of how we serve the Lord. There's lots of different ways that you serve the Lord with a spiritual gift that entails and utilizes natural gifts as well, and these are brought together. But ultimately the question is, how, what is the best way for me to utilize my natural gifts and my spiritual gifts for the ministry within the body? 
because spiritual gifts are given to every individual for the purpose of ministering to one another, not outside the church, but within the local body. And so the question needs to be, how do I think I can best utilize my natural gifts, my spiritual gifts to serve the body? That's the operational will of God, and that could manifest in a number of different ways, just depending on the needs, the circumstances uh, of any local congregation. I want to give you an example from Scripture on uh, how these three categories of God's will work that we've been talking about in terms of God's revealed will, His uh, permissive will, and His overriding will. In the Old Testament, turn with me to Numbers chapter 22. We just hit some high points here on... Uh, on this is one of those amusing little stories in the Old Testament that has great ramifications. Now, we're not going to get into the details of Balaam's prophecies in chapter 23, but there are some things to learn in the setup to the events of chapter 23 that apply to understanding the uh, will of God. Balaam is this prophet for hire. He is probably an Old Testament believer, but he is utilizing whatever abilities he has uh, in an extremely illegitimate manner, He's charging for it, making money for it. He's, maybe he's using uh, uh, some uh, occult arts in the process. All of that is, is sort of extraneous to what we're teaching. But he has developed a reputation. Now, this is at a time when the Israelites are at the end of their 40 years of discipline in the, uh, in, in the desert, and they are beginning to move north uh, on the... Uh, Transjordan on the east side of the Jordan River Valley, and they're moving up through the territory of uh, of Moab, and they are going to enter into the land that God has promised them. Now, God told them because Moab is a distant relative of the Israelites. Remember, Moab was one of the two sons of Lot, so this is sort of a, they're sort of second cousins to Abraham, and that. But nevertheless, the Moabites are. Uh, under the leadership of Balak. And uh, Balak is uh, uh, threatened by this approaching uh, mob of about 2 million to 3 million people moving through the wilderness, and he thinks they're going to attack him, so he decides that, the, that he wants to uh, destroy them. So using the pagan mentality, he's going to get uh, Balaam to come and utter a curse and curse the uh, uh, curse the Jews so that they will uh, not um, uh, not be able be successful in attacking him. And so, as as this unfolds, uh, because God is fully omniscient and fully aware of what is going on, um, God is going to uh, give some direct revelation to Balaam, and in. Um, Verse 9, God comes to Balaam. We don't know whether this was in a dream or how this manifested itself. The text isn't clear. Uh, but God comes to Balaam and says, Who are these men with you? And Balaam tells him who they are. And God says, Direct revelation, verse 12. You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. Now, it doesn't get any more clear than that. What is God's will for Balaam's life? At this point in time, it is not to go with the people who've invited him and not to curse Israel. But Balaam has his own volition. And Balaam's looking at the money. And Balaam wants to go, really wants to go with him. And so he is going to um, try to work out some sort of, uh, uh, of compromise. And so we read in verse 13 Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, uh, uh, Go back to your land, for the Lord has refused to give me permission to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose, went back to Balak, and Balaam said, Balaam refused to go with us. But they understand, there's a current here, they understand that this guy really wants to, maybe we can entice him with a little more money. And so Balak is going to send um, a little more money with him and offer him more. And now Balaam really wants to go. And uh, again, this time, God comes to him and gives him permission. Now, this isn't what God, in, in, his, in his revealed will, really wants Balaam to do. The, 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 the first command is clearly the overriding command, I don't want you to go. But Balaam's going to exercise his volition now, and he's going to go anyway. So God gives him permission to go, but he still keeps this, the restrictions in place. 
But just because God allows something to happen doesn't mean it's doesn't mean it's right. And the reason I say that is because I hear a lot of people uh, sort of a backdoor blaming of God for something. Something happens, you say, well, it must have been God's will. No, God's highest will is for the right decisions based on Scripture to be followed. Anything less than that, which is wrong or evil or sinful, is simply the result of God's permissive will. He allows people to make bad decisions. God doesn't, isn't validating those bad decisions. And yet, if you listen carefully to the way people say things, something happens, and it's, it's not really what they think is the best thing, and they say, well, and they try to comfort themselves. Well, that's God's will. No, that's God's, God allowed that crappy, sinful, horrible, evil thing to happen. But don't try to comfort yourself that somehow that makes it any better. And I hear that all the time from people because you're we're trying to somehow accept a wrong situation. But it's still a wrong situation. God's permissive will means that he allows evil things to happen. That's not because he wants, in a moral right sense, for those evil things to happen. So don't try to use, don't try to blame God for bad things. That's really what that does. Well, you know, God allowed that to happen, so that's God's will. So what you just did is you just blamed God for man's evil decisions. We can't do that. God gets blamed for a lot of things. So this is the permissive will of God, but there's still moral restrictions on this will. And he allows, uh, he tells Balaam, he says, uh, if the men come to call you, rise, go with him, but only the word which I speak to you that you shall do. You're not going to be able to say anything that I don't allow. And then we have the overruling will of God that happens uh, later on, and that is that Balaam's going to go along and he's going to try to curse them, but God doesn't let him. So God overrules his volition uh, at key times, he doesn't always he doesn't overrule every bad decision that people make. There are just key ones where that happens. So you have the whole episode with Balaam's donkey, where uh, the angel of the Lord appears before Balaam. The donkey can see the angel. Balaam doesn't, and uh, the the finally uh, uh, the Balaam just keeps beating his donkey uh, to get the donkey to go forward down the canyon. And the donkey won't go, and uh, God allows a donkey to talk, and the donkey says, why do you keep beating me? You know, I'm your good donkey. You've been riding me all your life. Why do you keep beating me? And so it's a funny little thing that goes on in the story, but the point is the angel of the Lord is appearing there to block his actions and reminds him once again that he's not going to be able to say anything unless the Lord uh, allows him to. And the point that I'm making in this is that even if you make a wrong decision related to God's geographic will uh, or his operational will, God's overriding will kicks in and resolves the problem. You can't miss out on God's will. That's what I'm saying. I'm taking a negative to, uh, to demonstrate this positive here, but it's just like Jonah. But let's say you really want to do God's will, and God in his uh, sovereign will which he hasn't revealed to you, would like for you to go to this location rather than that location. You sit down, you pray, you consult with friends, you do everything you know you should do, and you decide to do A instead of B. But God wants you to do B. Everything's going to shut down on A, and it's going to end up where all you can do is B. You don't have to guess it ahead of time and try to figure out figure that out. You just trust in the Lord, do the best you can, and God's going to direct your paths. So we see this same kind of principle in Acts 15, 6 to 22. And in that passage, in this section where we see uh, Paul and Barnabas making decisions, notice how they make a decision. They, they, they don't pray. They don't say, God, should we go back and revisit them? They say, it's, it, it seems best to us. Uh, and so they just make a decision to go back and g- revisit those cities to reestablish uh, things that are going on there. In Acts chapter 15, I don't have time to go back and go through all of that, and I want to wrap this up this morning, is in Acts chapter f- uh, 15 where we have the what is called the Jerusalem, uh, the Jerusalem Council um, meeting. It, 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 again and again, we have uh, them making certain kinds of decisions. Uh, and in uh, Acts 15.25, that when the council makes its final decision, it doesn't say this is God's will. They don't say God told us to do this. 
They say, it seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. And then three verses later, it says, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. See, what they've done is they've taken all of the information and they've come to a decision. They haven't said, this is what God told us to do. They've said, as a result of our analysis of all of this and applying everything that's been revealed to us, it seems to us this is the right decision. And that is a wisdom approach uh, to the scriptures. I'm going to skip ahead here a few, pass- a few things. Uh, point 17, every incident of a specific will of God that we have in the scripture, we only know that because there's special revelation involved. The point that I'm making is don't expect God to do something he's not doing anymore. He is no longer in the process of giving specific revelation. He, he's given that to you. He wants to know what can you do with it. That's the test. Are you willing to study the word and let it become so much a part of your life that you can make wise decisions or not? That's the, that's the issue. Now, in the Old Testament, we also have a couple of cases, such as with Nehemiah, where Nehemiah has an interesting phrase that he uses. He says, God put this in my heart or in my mind. He's not making a specific revelatory claim, but after the fact, he realizes that God was guiding and directing him and that those thoughts that he had, those ideas that he had, really had their source in God. It seemed like God, that God put those things on his mind. He uses that phrase twice in Nehemiah 2.2 and in 7.5. But most of the other decision-making that Nehemiah makes, he makes on the basis of just applying the word to the circumstances that he found. Now, in conclusion, what I want you to take away from this, when you, we face decisions in life, there are two kinds of decisions, basically. There's one kind, which I've referred to as moral decisions or immoral decisions. These are decisions that involve clear biblical revelation of what is right and what is wrong. And that is God's clearly revealed will. Then there are other decisions in other areas of, of life where there are not, they don't involve specifics of God's revelation. They don't involve specific uh, statements of something being right and something being, uh, something being wrong. And so we, um, we recognize that in those decisions, what we're doing is we're taking from the whole realm of doctrine that's in our soul, and we are applying it then to those specific uh, situations. Now, next time we'll come back and we're going to look at this in terms of the next verse, which has some interesting things to say about uh, letting the Word of Christ dwell in our hearts and how we accomplish that and what, how that works out in other areas. Uh, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be together this morning, to study your word, be reminded of your revelation, your will. Help us in the decisions we make. I know that there are people in the congregation facing uh, extremely challenging, difficult uh, circumstances and decisions, and this involves uh, wisdom and skill. And in some cases, there are specific rights and wrongs, but in other cases, there are not. And so, Father, we just pray that you would uh, enable them through your word uh, to make wise decisions. Father, above all, we pray that if there's anyone here this morning unsure of their salvation or uncertain of their eternal destiny, that they would take this opportunity to make that both sure and certain. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, and and because of that, and you can have eternal life. And it's simply by trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior. It doesn't involve anything else. Jesus paid it all. All you need to do is trust in him. Now, Father, we pray that you would guide and direct us today, keep us safe on the roads in light of the weather. And, Father, we pray that you would uh, continue to uh, really bless those who are working up at Camp Arete. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.